Good afternoon or morning, wherever you are, and welcome to this webinar organised by Resilience First in partnership with Fusion Risk Management. I'm Robert Hall, the Executive Director of Resilience First. Uh, for those of you who were unable to view the opening video, a Resilience First mission is to help build resilience across business communities, whether those communities be defined by geography or special interest. We have organized today's webinar to shed some light on aspects of resilience and risk, particularly in the light of a pandemic that has shaken up our thinking about how uh, a known risk, uh, but one for which we are clear, have clearly been unprepared and ill-equipped uh, to manage. Yet well before COVID-19 struck, a prescient forward to a book published in 2015 called Team of Teams, by US General Stanley McChrystal, spoke volumes of the inadequacy of our approach to risk. It said, and I quote, management models based on planning and predicting instead of resilient adaptation, circumstances, change circumstances are no longer suited to today's challenges. That statement, I think, encapsulates the aim of this webinar, hence the title of the event, transitioning from risk to resilience. We've asked the speakers to offer their individual perspectives on this theme, and knowing their backgrounds, I feel sure we will be given some fascinating insights. I'd also like to thank, or add to this uh, event, uh, or, sorry, I'd also like to add that this event will be supported by a 23-page white paper on the same subject to be released in the new year. The report, again partnered with Fusion, is a, com a compilation of articles by 10 authors who take a look at the challenges and some of the solutions. All the participants on this call will duly receive a free copy. We are fortunate to have with us today the CEO of Fusion Risk Management, Bob Civic, who has kindly agreed to chair this event. In a minute, I will invite Bob to say a few words about the work of Fusion and introduce our three speakers today. After they have spoken, there will be a panel discussion followed by a Q&A session. I encourage all of you to ask questions of the speakers throughout the session by posting, ideally briefly, questions in the chat box to the right of your screen. I'm sure the chair will pick up as many as he can in the Q&A session that follows. Bob, over to you. Thank you, Robert. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I trust. Um, I want to say hello and, and welcome to everyone and, and thanks for attending today. Uh, during the next hour, we're going to offer several new ideas on managing risk and resilience. We want you to think differently about how you go about managing risk and resilience. When, when Fusion Risk Management was founded in 2006, we believe traditional risk management and resilience practices needed to change. We intended to be disruptive and to enable practitioners to manage risks differently, more efficiently, effectively, and economically. We saw risk management as a necessary operational process that adds value to the organization. Over the past decade, we've witnessed the evolution of risk management as it integrates with crisis and event management, incident response, disaster recovery, and business continuity. Um, there have been changes in the way we create and manage and integrate data to produce information and even artificial intelligence to inform us on how to more effectively prevent, prepare for, and respond to disruptive events. We've developed frameworks to organize data that enable better command and control programs designed to make us more adaptive and durable as an organization. The systems that exist to help automate management processes for, for, for prevention and detection planning and preparation, response and recovery, notification and orchestration, and broader engagement throughout the organization are creating greater awareness and building a culture of resilience and significantly improving the first line of defense. And finally, we've experienced the first global event that has affected organizations in a multitude of ways, disrupting supply chains, displacing workers from the workplace, disabling the workforce, and straining access to information systems. The challenges that this has presented 
are not insurmountable. During the next decade, the siloed disciplines that have served us in the past will no longer adequately address the needs of the organization to deliver on their commitments. These disciplines must be entirely integrated to become more effective and efficient and to support the strategic initiatives of the organization. There will be competitive advantage for those organizations that are resilient. In a world where the threats are endless, but the resources to prevent them are not, the most resilient organizations will thrive during uncertain times, as we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. Resilience program metrics and key performance indicators that will be necessary to measure and manage efficiency and effectiveness and to ensure a return on investment will enable program managers to show how they support the organization's mission, provide value, and empower employees to act decisively. It will be necessary to go beyond the basic process risk metrics to show how single points of failure and process inefficiency affect key business outcomes. Process dependency mapping and process alignment to critical products and services will be necessary to bring focus and context to the risks that are most important to manage in this context. We can no longer think of measuring a risk only in terms of how it can cause financial harm to the organization, but how it impacts the constituents that we support, the community in which we operate, the stakeholders, and most importantly, our customers. And we must continue to ensure that they trust us, that we can deliver for them. We're being challenged to transform how reliably we operate, and we must conceive new strategies based upon flexibility and agility. This will require new thinking about how we prevent, monitor, respond to, and recover from a disruptive events, and how we continue operations that produce desired outcomes during disruptive events, no matter what. The result? will be dynamic and resilient organizations with more durable ecosystems, trusted organizations capable of delivering on their commitments and fulfilling the promises made. To that end, we have today several very notable people in the industry joining me today on the panel uh, to speak in about different ways and methods to ensure that we can continue to evolve the way we look at risk and really transform how we operate into one of resilience. Um, our two fine gentlemen, the first I will introduce is Lord Toby Harris. Toby is the chair of the National Preparedness Commission and will spend a few minutes speaking on some of the most relevant topics um, that he sees moving forward in the future. Uh, Lord Harris, please take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bob. So, the most overquoted ancient Chinese curse, actually, I should admit that it's the only ancient Chinese curse I know, is may you live in interesting times. And certainly 2020 was not the year that any of us expected. I look around at the performance of our leaders over the last few months. And I'm reminded of the old joke. Why is leadership like a tea bag? You only find out how good it is when it gets into hot water. And certainly it is in a crisis that true leadership is put to the test. Uh, in another way, P.G. Woodhouse, the English comic writer, summed it up in his 1932 novel, Hot Water. If it is true that the hour produces the man, it is also true that it remorselessly reveals the washout. And of course, predicting crises is hard. Despite this, most countries do try to assess the risks they face and plan to mitigate them. Epidemics have occurred traumatically throughout history. And pandemic flu has been in the top tier of the UK's National Risk Register since it was first published a decade ago. Yet COVID, is not flu. And the UK, like many other nations, struggled to respond rapidly and effectively. Now, such assessments are a matter of judgment. For example, um, in the UK Risk Register, the uh, impact of, quote, new and emerging infectious diseases, which would have included COVID, was assessed as having a, 
and I quote, low likelihood of spreading to the UK. And again, I quote, the impact could be on the scale of the SARS outbreak in Toronto, Canada, with 251 cases over several months. Now, I'm not going to rehearse the details of the number of cases in the UK, but you can see that that judgment was clearly wrong. So in the UK, the risk was logged, but it was not assigned with a sufficiently serious level, uh, level of um, uh, likelihood. And moreover, it was felt that the preparations in place for a pandemic flu outbreak would probably be sufficient. Now, I'm tempted to dwell at length about what went wrong, but I will resist it. However, the UK was not alone. Many governments had their failures, either in preparation or in execution of their response to COVID-19. Similarly, many organisations, when they look at their response to some crisis that has arisen, will often realise that their risk management systems have not protected them. Indeed, there will be many organisations who feel they have dealt with a potential problem by the mere act of putting it on their risk register. And of course, that risk register is often taken as the last item at a busy board meeting, relegated to the final few minutes as people are packing up their papers to leave. And then when something does happen, when there is a major shock to the system, many organisations pat themselves on the back that they've been resilient if they manage to bounce back quickly and can speedily return to near normal operation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But actually, the ambition should be greater. The aim should be to learn from what has happened, not merely so that the particular eventuality that has occurred can be dealt with or avoided if it happens again, but rather to so toughen the organisation that it becomes better able to respond to and avert some completely different threat. That which does not kill us makes us stronger. Rather like the broom in the original version of Walt Disney's Fantasia that carries on working more and more effectively every time Mickey Mouse tries to chop it up. That is the process, the cyclical process of continually learning from experience and using that learning to strengthen the organisation ready for the next crisis. And if there is no crisis, then organisations should practice and exercise for one. And don't simply breathe a sigh of relief when the exercise is over. Instead, assess what didn't work well and what could have gone better and fix it for the next time. In short, don't do what the UK did after exercise Cygnus in October 2016. That looked at a global pandemic and found uh, that it was likely that the NHS would collapse from a lack of resources and highlighted problems with the availability of medical ventilators and personal protective equipment. Yet all the problems identified in 2016 played out this year during the early months of COVID. So the learning had not taken place. And actually there is a lesson for all of us, probably an overriding lesson, probably in every country is that we have probably not been investing sufficiently in our preparedness and resilience. Above all, we must be prepared to expect the unexpected. I rather like the taxonomy which says we have to be ready not only for the black swans, previously unobserved, high impact, hard to predict rare events, but also the black jellyfishes, things that we think we know about and understand, but which turn out to be more complex and uncertain, sometimes with a long tail and a nasty sting at the end. And then there are the black elephants, challenges visible to everyone, but which no one wants to deal with. And we've got to get beyond simply admiring the scale of such problems. Making every organization more resilient creates a sort of herd immunity, if I can use that phrase, for a society that is then going to be better able to address future global crises, whether it's a new pandemic or a massive cyber attack or climate change, whatever it may be. So every organisation has its role to play in making the wider community more able to deal with difficult shocks and events. And it certainly 
if you've gone through that process, easier to manage the consequences of such events, both for ourselves and collectively. Now, often the responses needed are threat neutral. The steps necessary are the same, whatever, whatever the hazard. The example I give is that in the early days of COVID, it was necessary to identify and support vulnerable people living on their own. Well, that's the same whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a flood or an earthquake or whatever else may have happened. Those steps are those that you ought to be able to take automatically. And the message is resilience needs to be designed in and part of society's fabric. I said earlier on, we must be prepared to expect the unexpected. Now, be prepared was of course the law, was of course Lord Baden Powell's motto for the Scout Movement. The meaning being that you must prepare yourself by having thought out beforehand how to act in any accident or situation that might occur so as never to be taken by surprise. And what's more, you should practice it so that automatically and instinctively you did the right thing at the right moment. Now, I'm not sure that the 1908 edition of Scouting for Boys or the 1912 sister version for girls, How Girls Can Build Up the Empire, actually spelt out the implications of a global pandemic. But they did at least in embryo equip Baden Powell's scouts with the principles of strategic risk management. And managing to be actively resilient is good management. It means your organization is agile and innovative. It means you are empowering your people and engaging with your community. As a result, because you do that automatically, your organization is more likely to be efficient. It is more likely to be successful. Now, planning and responding to risks is not cost free, but not doing so is worse. Or as John F. Kennedy put it, there are risks and costs to action, but they are far less than the long range costs of comfortable inaction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toby. And now I'd like to go to our next panelist, uh, Thomas Wallace. Thomas is a partner at Rift Dynamics, a part of the McKinsey and Company. And uh, Thomas, I'd like you to obviously say a few words before we get into some of the questions. And I will say that we've already received some very interesting questions from the audience. Thank you. So take it away, Tom. Super, thank you. And it's very nice to be here. So in my role, I focus on risk within financial services, particularly around modeling and analytics. And coming from this background, I wanted to touch on what we can learn about resilience from the way that sector has evolved. So really covering three things, why resilience is so important in financial services, what we've learned from COVID-19, and then speculating a little bit, what does the future look like? So resilience clearly has a high profile in financial services. The workings of the financial system are totally critical from the basic utilities of cash and payments and salaries to lending, savings, investments, pensions. And then there's the wider functioning of the financial markets so one example being FX settlement, there's complex algorithmic processes working behind the scenes to reallocate currencies around the world efficiently without draining liquidity. And we've had a bit of a taste for how important resilience is with some high profile system failures. So, you know, thinking about this time of year, last year's Black Friday 2019, customers at some major banks were unable to access their accounts, which presumably prevented them from buying desperately needed discounted headphones and TVs. But um, COVID has put a lot of pressure on this. Um, many more of us are using digital banking. Um, it can be challenging getting support when there's failures, and we've got increased reliance on systems for all kinds of payments. But resilience is also about, is, is becoming more and more difficult as firms become more driven by analytics, with models being used to uh, drive many decisions that are being made, and huge amounts of our activity becoming digital. Now, this can be very powerful, but it also increases our dependency on the systems and the infrastructure. A financial services firm has not been standing still on this, and it's clearly a highly regulated space, and financial resilience has been thought about quite carefully. Banks increased capital buffers significantly um, after previous crises. Um, 
we've introduced stress testing to test the resilience against a variety of uh, possible scenarios that could occur. And um, some big firms are actually designated as systemically important where their failure would be expected to cause really widespread issues. And that just results in some increased oversight. But the latest announcements from UK authorities are actually more to do with operational resilience. And that's identifying important business services that could harm consumers or market integrity if they get disrupted, mapping out the different components that support those services, and setting tolerance for the impact and testing the ability to remain within those tolerances. And these elements can be relevant to a wide range of firms across different sectors. What have we learned from COVID-19? I mean, it's clearly had a profound impact on lives and livelihoods and continues to be so. Um, we're very much hoping, of course, that uh, the end is in sight. Um, but in the context of financial services, there's been a wide range of effects, including changes to the nature of operations and changes in the risks that are faced. Um, as I said before, there's a big increase in our reliance on digital channels. Um, everyone who's spending hours a day on Zoom will presumably attest to that. Um, but there's also financial crime and operational risk. Um, the sudden change to working from home altered the nature of oversight and controls and the potential increase for cyber events and fraud was noted as well. And then if you take insurance as another example, huge changes in customer behavior and exposure to risk and sometimes very counterintuitive results. So there were some reports of um, much lower claim frequency for motor, but when those claims occurred, they were much higher because people were driving less often, but when they did, the roads were clear and they went very fast. In addition to that, the rules of the game have changed a lot. So employee support schemes and subsidized lending and all of these changes in the way that we're acting day to day, they really change everything that we've looked at in the past. And so the raw material that we actually have to work with for risk management has been compromised. The, the, the behavior of customers, um, the way that we're operating, the data that we have um, from the past, it just doesn't tell us that much about the future in this environment. And um, for example, banks that are tackling credit risk won't necessarily know what losses have been incurred or how they've been incurred um, until support schemes start to unwind. So what does the future look like? Well, I mean, we, I think we could actually divide this into two parts. So the first is what do firms need to do to become more resilient? And then the second, which is a little bit tangential, is what is the role that firms can play in building resilience in our economies and societies? So first thinking about building resilience itself. So we need to be prepared for the next black swan, um, not just building defenses against what has come before. And this was very clear from some discussions we held recently with around 70 banks globally on how they handle the risk from their models and analytics. And they said, that their learning point was that they need a crisis toolkit, or even better, they wanted their models and their governance to help ensure stability under any kind of crisis. Some industries have used this concept of a digital twin to do this. Um, you might have a replica of a jet engine that helps with scheduling preemptive maintenance and proactively addressing issues before they become a problem. Now, when it comes to systems and models, this might take the form of increased monitoring being built in, which can alert users to issues as they arise, or maybe even before they arise, and allow proactive responses to be taken. And one example uh, that I saw was an insurance firm uh, used a model to manage its call center capacity, the number of people on the phones, but it got completely swamped after there was a change to their terms and conditions, and, and they had an unprecedented surge in calls. Now, monitoring would actually have spotted this unusual behavior, and the fact that the model was diverging from actual experience, and given them time, to ramp up their capacity and deal with those calls and prevent a lot of those frustrated customers. And as things get more sophisticated, models can become more defensive, potentially handling unusual situations better or more safely. Um, we've seen kill switches being used in financial markets in algorithmic trading, which are designed to prevent models from doing too much damage if something goes wrong. Now, it's a very blunt example, but it can prevent a big impact. And we saw some of this in the, the flash crash in 2010. But how should firms build resilience? Well, the fundamentals of good risk management are, are a good starting point. We shouldn't throw out what we do well already. But um, as we build um, more sophisticated systems and analytics, we should take the opportunity to incorporate robustness and redundancy into the design of those systems, um, but also the, the wider ecosystem. So that means scalability and adaptability, maybe using cloud systems that allow um, shifts in consumer demand to be handled more easily. 
It means good data management to reduce error rates and support horizon scanning, giving us a better view of what's happened to date might help us a little bit with understanding what's going to happen in the future. And then increasing flexibility. So things like having APIs for interfaces between companies and systems just to take away bottlenecks, bottlenecks and allow rapid adaptation to new situations. Now, what can firms uh, do to build resilience in economies and in our societies? So financial services are part of an intricate operational web of our everyday lives. Um, and that's essential to keep things flowing smoothly. But we also need to think about how they can create resilience outside of the organizations. Now, one example of this is the increasing use of ESG assessments. So directing capital to firms that have good governance and social responsibility. This could be considered as one way which firms are actually helping to build resilience by supporting more resilient organizations. And another is the role that insurance companies might play in uh, supporting resilience to climate change. Um, they, they, they're going to have financial risks that they're exposed to, but they can also play a role in helping individuals and communities manage the changes that will affect them, such as introducing mitigation measures like flood defences or developing standards for property construction or land development that help avoid us creating new risks that we then have to manage. So in conclusion, um, resilience is clearly critical in financial services. It's an essential part of our lives. And the developments we've seen today have been helpful. And there's learning points from those developments that could help with other industry sectors. But we can go further and we will continue to see risk management pushed towards resilience. And we will always try to predict what will happen next, but we have to be defensive and robust in the face of the things that we cannot anticipate. Thank you. Tom, thank you very much for that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce one more panelist, Dr. Pippa Malvin, and I'd last, like her to say a few words to the audience, and then we'll start to answer some questions. So please proceed, Doctor. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I thought what I might do is bring a slightly different angle to this whole question of resilience. Um, and particularly in light of what's been happening in, you know, this last year. And that is to bring an example from the world of Formula One. You guys probably saw there was a terrible accident in Formula One very recently. And in Formula One, when you work with the engineers, they say that their job is to deconstruct those cars once a day and to try to shave off a single gram of weight because that single gram of weight might be the thing that allows that car to win the race, but it might be the single gram that holds the car together. The line between efficiency and resilience is a very, very fine line. And the thing is, you don't know where it is unless you test it. And so we've been tested at a societal level by all these new pressures, uh, not just COVID, but the world economy slowing more generally. And, and I think the thing is we now as a, as a, you know, people are putting more weight on resilience than on efficiency. This is an incredible mindset shift. Uh, and I know from, uh, as many of you will know, I was working in the white house when nine 11 happened, a very similar kind of pressure cooker of circumstances that, forces you to confront that one gram, whatever the subject matter is that you're dealing with. And, and also realize that the only way you can find out where that pressure point really is, is by bringing the pressure to bear on it. In that way, I think what's happened with COVID and general pressures is in kind of been a gift. Uh, it's permitted us to move away from this belief that as long as you get more efficiency, anything goes. Uh, I'll go a little further and say that interconnectedness has also become more obvious and apparent to people because of what's happened in, um, again, this last year, this extraordinary year. And this idea that resilience is not something that happens in a silo, on an isolated basis. It's about the interconnectedness of things and often the unexpected interconnectedness of things. 
anyway, all of that is to say that um, I think the the ability to explain why resilience requires our attention, why resilience first plays a part in organizations, in government thinking and policy thinking, all of this is becoming much easier because of the hard circumstances that we've had. Um, and I see it popping up in such interesting ways. Uh, like for example, in, in London, in Britain, this idea that approvals are being given to, uh, for building, for buildings, uh, that frankly, if you want to upgrade a building, build something new, there you're no longer going to have the planning permission folks holding you up for a really long time. They're just pretty much proving whatever's brought to them. Now, I'm all for protecting the integrity of the, of the environment, but I'm also all for innovation. And what I expect to have happen is we're going to end up with multi-purpose buildings that now will have things like urban farms on them. And do we need more farm production, food production in cities? Yes, we do. Would that bring more resilience? Yes, it would. Is it essential then that you get permissions for buildings to have urban farms? Yes, it is. And so this interconnectedness of things, I think, is now becoming more uh, prevalent in, in the way people think about things. And this is only an advantage. So there's a lot to say about resilience. I realize I've come in a little bit late. I apologize for that. I've got a few things running. Uh, but let's see about going to the panel for the time I have left to talk to you about these issues more broadly. Well, thank you very much, Pippa, and I uh, appreciate that introduction and those comments from our panelists. Um, I think at this point, Robert, we'd probably like to have everybody turn their cameras back on so the audience can see us. Um, several great questions from the audience. Uh, before we jump to that, though, I did want to ask one question of each of the panelists. I'd like to get their answer to this because in, in all cases, they did speak about the organization and the culture and the way we have to think more about uh, the people within the organization uh, supporting that resilience. And I'm just wondering um, what in particular should be done to create a culture of resilience within an organization. And um, I'm going to start with you because you look like you're the most interested in answering that question. Uh, yeah, and also, unfortunately, I have to hop to go do another presentation. But um, I do think a culture of resilience has to be a culture that gets really comfortable with change, really comfortable with uh, new things, new ways of interacting, new ideas, new locations, that uh, flexibility is inherent. And so anything you can do to get your team more comfortable with the process of change is integral to improving resilience. Uh, Lord Harris, would you like to comment? Yeah, I think um, and Pippa's absolutely right. Yes, you've got to um, uh, encourage that, but you've also got to create a culture in which um, you allow, you value, people taking their own initiatives because when something happens there may well not be the opportunity for the traditional command line you may well not have got a plan for a particular um, uh, uh, event or whatever and so you've got to do that and that involves two things it involves not only uh, enabling people to make decisions on the front line in terms of what needs to be done but it also means that you've got to have created over time uh, an atmosphere of trust so that people trust their senior management, that they recognize that if they do the, if they, if they honestly try to do the right thing, even if it goes wrong or something doesn't go right, they're not going to have a ton of bricks dropped on them afterwards um, and said, why did you do that? And, 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 and so on. So it's creating that mutual trust and that's about a style of organization and style of management, which unfortunately many organizations simply do not have or do not value. Tom, would you like to add a few more words to that? 
I, I think some great points made already, I think particularly around um, uh, the ability to be flexible. I think we hear a lot about agile working uh, these days. And I think that um, uh, that allows us to bring the right mix of capabilities to a given situation. And um, you know, the, the intent of that is increased productivity and efficiency um, in some situations, but I think it also offers a, a you know a great solution for resilience and adaptation. So when faced with something that's unexpected, the ability to very quickly put together the best team of people with the right mix to solve that problem, um, and having the flexibility to do that, and the cultural sort of um, acceptance of a way of working that looks like that, and being effective in that way of working already could be extremely helpful. It just means that firms can be agile in their responses which is one of the things that helps you get ahead of the problem and, and uh, avoid any lasting impact. Thank you. Uh, we have gotten a significant number of very good questions. So rather than me taking up everyone's time asking questions, I think I'm going to start to throw in some of the uh, audience or participant questions. So um, let's start with one that was directed at me. Actually, I'll ask Lord Harris to answer this. Um, and the question is that we, we speak about the wider impact of resilience. Do we see any overlap with corporate social responsibilities and obligations? And how do we bring that into our thought processes when we think about risk management and resilience? Uh, well, it's the ultimate sort of uh, corporate social responsibility if you've made your organization resilient. But at the same time, you've not only thought about your, your own organization, but the organization, all the other entities that depend on you, whether they're your clients, um, your um, suppliers, uh, your employees, uh, all the people in the, lo in the locality. I mentioned the idea that if you made every organization more resilient and better able to cope with a crisis, that helped build a sort of herd immunity a concept we keep hearing about at the present time um, in terms of the way in which society as a whole responds to it. Now, that, if you like, is a type of corporate social responsibility. I think the trouble with linking it formally with corporate social responsibility is that I suspect the concept of CSR has become a little bit devalued. There are too many companies who simply look at their uh, look at CSR in terms of how is it and how does it enhance our image and our brand, and how does it bring us business which actually isn't what it's supposed to be about. It's about recognizing that you're part of a community and you should play your part in it as a corporate citizen. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I'm gonna to give you the next one. You spoke a lot about operational resilience and there was an interesting question that came in about what the downsides of operational resilience might be. Uh, the cost of becoming resilient and, and is, it, is it really a free lunch or is it something that's gonna cost an organization a lot uh, yeah, it, I, and I think this is a it's a, it's a fair a good and a fair observation. So um, there are there are there are costs to doing everything. I mean, it's a it, it, very simply you buy a more expensive car, it might be a bit more reliable. Okay, but um, whether that makes financial sense in the long run is okay. That's that's a different calculation. There are clearly costs involved with some of the things I spoke about, particularly when you're talking about systems and infrastructure. Um, maybe you're talking about enhancing a lot of the, the, the systems and the models and the analytics that you use and making them quite cutting edge. Um, it's not a free lunch. Um, I, I think that one thing that's, that's become clear is there's an asymmetry between the, um, the cost of doing something today versus some nebulous future risk and some uh, firms make their business out of quantifying those things. So insurance companies, that's what they do. They think about what money do you pay me today for some risk that I'm going to face um, that may or may not turn out to ha have an event attached to it. Um, most firms don't have to think about that. And um, as a result, the value decision that they're making doesn't necessarily involve the second part of the equation. So it can seem like a, an expensive thing to do. Now, I think there are, there are two aspects to this. The first is that there's often collateral benefits. So the firms that have invested um, in things that will build their resilience will also often benefit from efficiencies. That, so you do get a bit of a payback. 
And one example is, um, you know, banks that are um, that are, are setting up really robust data backbone and infrastructure, they can use um, analytics that wouldn't be available on their old systems that actually help them improve their performance. They might be able to uh, identify um, how best to serve their customers much more rapidly. They might be able to process things much more efficiently. They might have fewer systems outages or less maintenance to do. And all of these things are beneficial to them. I think the second thing is, is there a mechanism by which firms start to think about that longer term view and the risk that they face in the future? And um, one of the things in financial services that's, that's sort of sparked out a bit is the idea of stress testing. And more recently, firms have been asked to think about climate stress testing. And if you want to get long term and uncertain, that's a pretty good uh, case study. So firms are having to think about the impact of things going out to 2050 and work out what that's going to do to their business. Now, clearly that involves a certain amount of speculation um, as well as lots of careful modeling and, and thinking. But um, what it does do is it embeds in the organization this idea that if you do nothing, stuff will happen. And you don't necessarily know what it is, but a lot of it's pretty bad. So um, it starts to get to that mindset and that cultural sort of understanding of um, doing nothing is, is not necessarily the right thing. It, it comes down to the point about inaction. So whether you can embed that into other firms is, is, a, is another matter. But I think that starting to understand that you're making a decision between spend today or potentially some cost is quite important. We've, um, we've talked a lot about being more proactive than reactive or taking action rather than uh, inaction. And uh, Lord Harris, I think I'd like to ask this question. I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, but um, since, since you spoke so much about being proactive and continuously improving, um, what, what do you do with an organization if they're just satisfied that they got through COVID-19 and they feel like this is probably the worst they'll ever see and really doesn't have a desire to want to learn or improve anymore? They feel comfortable and confident as a result of their ability to get through this recent challenge. I'm tempted to say that um, you should sell your shares in them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you look at a, a company which is in that position and certainly breathe a huge sigh of relief and said, hey, we got through that, aren't we good? Then they're not learning from that. And whilst they may have been lucky in getting through uh, or better prepared because they'd actually specifically thought about it, I do wonder whether that's, the, uh, that, that's a sufficient response. And if something different happens, they're the ones which are likely to go under. So I think there will be a market process by that. I mean, my, my thesis, and I'd love somebody in the audience or, you know, or whoever to be able to prove this, is that an organization which is determined to be actively resilient, to learn from things and so on, is going to be an organization which responds to everything better, is more competitive, is more able to change with the times, is more able to respond to new things which aren't necessarily threats, but, but to see them as opportunities. So, I mean, I think that's the way that they have to go. I think it's about a matter of style. And I think I suspect that the market is going to ultimately start favoring those people. But we do have to get away from the um, traditional view of what, what is the bottom line. One's got to start accepting that um, we shouldn't be in a just-in-time culture because it absolutely cuts the cost of the bone. We've also got to have uh, a just-in-case culture, which recognises that you've got to have built in a degree of robustness and a degree of resilience, which I think was one of the points that uh, Tom made um, in his presentation. Mm -hmm. and, and Tom, I'm going to ask a kind of a corollary to that, that question, uh, because in the financial realm, uh, we're not allowed to be complacent. There are regulators and regulations that must be followed. You must be compliant with that. Um, yet, I, I suspect you've probably seen and you've probably dealt with some organizations that are not adopting um, the regulations as much as they should be for operational resilience. And, and how do you get them or encourage them to make that investment to be compliant other than expecting a regulator is going to write them up in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, financial services is, is certainly 
highly regulated and there's a lot of interest uh, in what firms are doing. Interestingly, that um, that the nature of that in, that interest that, that supervisors take varies a bit uh, depending on the region you're in. Um, it can be sort of broad and principles based. It can be very detailed, literally looking through individual papers. Um, so we see different models of enforcing this. Um, now, I think that um, there are firms that want to lead in these areas and they want to get out ahead of the regulation. To some extent, they want to set the standard. And I think for the regulators as well, that's helpful because it shows what can be done. And then there are firms that maybe want to sort of do what they have to and, and, and maybe nothing more than that. Um, you can see these as different schools of thought. I think that um, this is, you know, this is a situation where um, the the regulations that are being proposed are there to help protect firms and keep them stable. And um, management need to decide to what extent they agree with that and how far they want to go with adopting it. But fundamentally, it comes down to how you want to manage the business. And then, um, you know, provided that you are complying with the regulations, um, beyond that point, uh, you know, firms choose how much they want to lead. So we see this with certain types of governance. We see it with newer initiatives for climate. Um, and really, it then comes down to what the market and the investors and the consumers really think of that. So with something like operational resilience, um, there's an enormous benefit to not being a laggard in this area when you're in a business that serves consumers or has other like particularly essential uh, infrastructure functions. Um, if you are not necessarily keeping quite up to the standards that you should, and you have a problem and it's extremely visible, it's unlikely to serve you well. So a lot of firms have suffered enormous uh, damage as a result of uh, systems failures that they've had. Um, and it's reputational uh, in terms of their consumers, um, it also affects individuals within the company who may have responsibilities to those, but it also gets increased regulatory scrutiny. And I, I don't really see why this would be any different. So I think fundamentally, it's, you know, management can decide how far they want to go with uh, implementing the requirements that have been specified by regulators. But, you know, fundamentally, they're all competing in a marketplace where there will be people who are leading the pack and uh, their consumers and their, you know, the people who are financing and investing them. Get to choose between those companies. Thank you. Um, Lord Harris, I'm going to throw this one at you. The one, there's a question about preparing for the unknowns versus the knowns. And how, how do you prepare effectively for the unknowns? Is it more about capabilities versus plans and principles versus rules? Or, or how should a firm go about um, ensuring? that it is prepared for some of those unknowns? Uh, well, I mean, in a sense, it's a truism. Uh, you can't prepare for an, an unknown unknown. Uh, however, um, there are two elements to my, my approach to this. One is that whatever the crisis, you, need to, you, you can break it down into a number of areas of response. I mentioned um, the issue about... Uh, localities being able to identify and support vulnerable people living on their own. Um, that's something which it doesn't really matter what the initiating threat was. Once you reach a certain scale, that was something you needed to be able to do. And I think it's trying to break down the nature of the response into those small components um, so that you can be ready. Uh, you can, uh, you can, well, we're going to need to do this. We know how to do it because we've done it before or we, we know um, how we would set about doing it. I suspect a response which is based entirely on we have got a playbook for this particular eventuality isn't going to work because usually when it's when the shock arrives it's not quite like that it's different and the question is how different is it going to be um, in the case of covid um, the uk had theoretically prepared for a um, flu pandemic and was allegedly ready for that it wasn't a flu pandemic so the stocks of personal protective equipment, which were kept by the government, weren't the right ones for a, a different contagion. Um, but you'd also got a situation 
in which the stockpiles that had been been kept, nobody had kept an eye on them. So they were now past their use by dates. And uh, a lot of it had to be had to be discarded. So it's it's about building that flexible response, recognizing that what arrives will probably not be what we were expecting, what we planned for, maybe what we'd rehearsed, but ensuring because you built that active resilience culture, people are going to um, learn and quickly respond um, in an agile fashion. And it's that agility in the way in which your organisation functions, which is probably going to see you through whatever the crisis may be. Excellent. And um, I want to add, I think it was in a conversation that we had uh, previously where you spoke more about the uh, focusing on the consequence rather than the cause. And I think that's an important thing to note as well. Um, there's too many threats and too many potential causes out there to basically address every one of them. Um, Tom, I'm going to throw another one at you. I, I thought this one was interesting, and since you're uh, a metrics guy, uh, there's a question on how a firm can demonstrate operational uh, or organizational resilience. And I would ask, is it more about the uh, metrics and the analysis, or is it more about the evidence and the ability to demonstrate it through testing and test results and things of that nature? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question, actually. I think the answer is probably both. Um, so, wh what we see is um, like in, what we see in practice is probably a result of trying to balance efficiency with effectiveness, and um, obviously striving to maximise both of those. So, the advantage of metrics is they're objective. Um, often, you can calculate them automatically. You can track them automatically. So. It's relatively easy to have a nice dashboard which is updated on a regular basis and only screams a big red flag when something's been um, Now, is that going to capture everything? No, probably not. And um, that's where a lot of these other elements come in. So the sorts of um, exercises we see firms using are um, obviously thinking through scenarios, um, formalized stress testing, but also um, you know, thinking through uh, individual scenarios just as a risk management exercise. Um, a lot of the time this is done in a very structured way for operational risk um, assessments. Uh, another is using war game type scenarios where um, you get somebody outside the organization or somebody within the organization who's independent to throw um, situations or construct situations that you have to work through as management. And there's lots of different tools that you have at your disposal. Now, some of those are very time consuming, but they can be a great way of demonstrating how resilience might work in practice and others are useful metrics that you can use to track what's going on. Um, but I think in, in practice, we see a combination of you precisely because you're trying to do such a wide range of things here that you need a, you need a, a big toolbox to do that. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you with one more that's, that's here. Um, because again, I know you've been working with a lot of financial institutions and have been close to the fact that uh, uh, there's a question about the convergence between risk appetite and impact tolerance, and I'm well aware that impact tolerance is the focus of many of the regulations out there. Um, do you think that these will remain distinct, uh, or are they going to become uh, interconnected disciplines? Um, it's a. I mean, I I think it's always hard to say exactly how it'll play out. But what what I would say is that risk appetite is born in my mind out of a business whose whose job is taking risk so um, you, you you want to take risk in order to make money for example when you're lending um, and you need to define your appetite for taking risk um, because it sort of defines the, the the scale of your ability to then make money but also to do so safe and that's a useful exercise that you need to think um, impact tolerance is maybe a slightly different thing so you're not making money out of the impact the impact is something that's bad generally and it's more a question of how bad would you allow it to get and how much money do you want to throw at reducing that and you could never get it to zero there will always be something that can create a failure but um you need to specify how like the way you draw the line there and um we've seen this in some situations where uh one concept is model risk so firms have risk around the models that they're using day to day for 
everything that goes on in their, their organizations. How much model risk, what's your model risk appetite? And a lot of people say to me, they have zero model risk appetite. Like I don't make money out of model risk. They, I don't want them to fail ever. But that's obviously impractical. And the same goes for your payment system failing or your um, online, your, your app failing. Like you, you have no appetite for happening but you have to accept that at some point it might, and you will, you know, you need to balance that against how much you will spend to make it resilient. So I, my sense is that conceptually, it would be good for these things to stay distinct because it focuses the mind on what the business is actually doing and the value trade-off you're making. And it allows, when you're thinking about resilience, to, um, for management to make decisions that are about um, actually the operational side of the business. What is the experience that we want our consumers to have and the role that we need to play within a, a broader ecosystem, and what is the cost that it's going to incur in order to hit that, that, that tolerance. Thank you. Uh, I really like this one question that we got from the audience. Um, I'm going to ask Lord Harris to answer this one. Uh, it really entails the idea of the essentials. Um, before the question is, reads as follows: Before we get into the uh, how we build resilience, do we not think organizations need to define their essentials? What are the most important elements that an organization can do, um, and what are the most important elements of that organization when it comes to delivering on its promise? Um, the example they used was with the Royal Navy. I won't read all of that, but does the panel think that organizations often lose sight of their essentials when performing um, risk management or trying to become more resilient? Chloe? Uh, yes, I think there is a real, uh, real danger of that. Um, I mean, the starting point ought to be um, we may not be able to get back to exactly where we were before. So what is it that is the core of what we do what is it that's essential for us, for our workforce, for the community that we serve, that we get back to doing, and then building out from that? And I suspect sometimes people get too bound up with the, 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 the details of all the things they do rather than focusing on that, on that core uh, essential. It's in the same way that an approach to cybersecurity is one which says, well, what are the crown jewels in cyber terms of your organization? Because above all else, they've got to be protected. Everything else, yes, it'd be, it's desirable to protect it, but it's critical that we must not let our, I don't know, our intellectual property uh, disappear or our client list, or, or perhaps more importantly, our, our, our client's financial details um, disappear uh, to a hacker. So it's defining that and thinking that through. What are we here with? Um which is within an organization, who should lead the range of initiatives around operational or organizational resilience? How, how do we bring that together? And who's the person or the, how do you put that, make that work inside an organization? I think it depends a bit on the organization, but um, you know, in reality, I think you need to have a few uh, different people involved in this. Uh, operations, there's typically you know, teams that are thinking about this, they know it, they live it day to day, they have the expertise you need. But then you have a risk team that's thinking about the, the slightly more sort of conceptual uh, events that may occur in the future. And I think the two together could do like a, a really great job. And it comes back a bit to what I said about agile working. You bring together the capabilities and you probably get the best results. Okay. Um, that was a very quick hour. I really appreciate the insights that have been provided by the panelists. And on behalf of Fusion Risk Management, wish to thank them. I also wish to thank all of the participants. A lot of very good questions that we did not get to. I apologize for that. We will make every effort to try to answer those uh, in a reasonable period of time. I will actually take it upon myself personally to ensure that, that we provide an answer as best we can. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Robert for the closing remark. Thank you very much, Bob. And I echo your sentiments. It's been a fascinating hour. I've really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, I hope many people listening have done likewise. Um, it really leaves me just to summarise. And on behalf of Resilience First and all the participants and the Fusion Risk Management, I'd like to thank very much the speakers and the chair uh, for their superb contributions today. Uh, we will be circulating a short summary in due course. And as Bob said, we'll try and answer many of your questions.
So finally, please do join us for our next webinar, which is after the, uh, the holiday, uh, when we'll be in a conversation with the Deputy Mayor uh, for Greater London Authority. So thank you, uh, and I will close by saying, say, stay safe. I wish you and your families the very po best possible and the most peaceful festive holiday and new year you can have. Goodbye and thank you again.